<laughs> Hello, Cam followers. This is the third one this week. We've been coming back from Christmas with a storm. And this is going to be a good one. Okay, so we are really, really lucky to have Professor Alex German here. He is like at the top of his game. So I really, really want you all to say hello, say welcome, because we're a friendly bunch. But please tell us more about yourself, Alex, so that everybody has trust in what you're about to say. Thanks very much, Hannah, and it's great to be here. So, who am I? I guess I'm. My name's Alex, I, I, or at the Fat Vet uh, is my Twitter handle. If you're interested, um, I'm a vet by training. Um, I guess for the last sort of 15, 20 years, my specialist area of interest is obesity in in dogs and cats, but more dogs than cats uh, so far. I work at the University of Liverpool. Um, and I guess what I, the way I've been able to learn a lot about this topic, learn about mistakes as well as success, is by running a specialist weight management clinic there. It's a subsidised service, so we see a lot of cases. Um, and as well as hopefully helping as many as possible of our uh, dogs and cats to lose weight, we can learn more about obesity and how best we can manage it. Yeah. So that's yeah. about it, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you are underplaying yourself. If you type obesity and canine online, you just keep coming up. It's unbelievable. You know, Alex German, Alex German, Alex German. Okay. <laughs> Everybody likes you. Your name is on nearly every paper. So we're really, really lucky to have you here. So thank you. Um, thank you. I'm more organised this year. Last year, I used to win it a lot more. Um, but I'm trying to be very professional now. And we have a structure again, guys. So tonight, we're going to be covering an overview of obesity, what's going on, um, what the underlying cause is, association of obesity with musculoskeletal disease, um, weight management strategies and the benefits of following them, um, what type of diets and um, are influential for obesity on A, and prevention of obesity, which is something that we really, really want. So we're going to crack straight on. <laughs> overview. Come on, tell us how bad it is. <laughs> to us gently. Yeah. Okay, um, so I guess really what we've got we're dealing with is a continuum. So we talk about obesity. Um, that to an extent is the extreme end of a condition which is characterized by excess body fat. And it's strictly speaking, a bit like in people, it's a continuum from something which would be considered a healthy weight through overweight and um, to obesity as the most sort of uh, significant and severe. If you were looking at prevalence in dogs, I, how common is it currently in the UK? We know that over half of all pet dogs are either overweight or have obesity. Mm. Now those figures, we, we don't have great year on year survey data. There's some from the, the US, which, uh, but we have some sort of studies done in at different time points. And generally speaking, things have been get, getting steadily worse. Um, what disturbs me, I guess, most is we, we did a survey a couple of years back and we found that even in the growing period, so we're looking at puppies to young dogs in their growth phase, 37% of them would be classed as overweight or, or obese. And it, it's a bit like with childhood obesity, that's the, you know, the big issue now. And it therefore means this is a, uh, is a problem, sadly, that's going to be getting worse before it gets better. Yeah, 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 and I think uh, that's that is a definite link. If they're carrying weight when they're younger, that is likely to carry on into adulthood, isn't it? I think that was Dr. Nick Cave saying this. Uh, yeah, and, and actually, it doesn't need to be Nick saying it. it. There's evidence for it as well in various species. So, a sad fact is that if you if a child has developed overweight or obesity so particularly even by 18 months of age if a, if, if a kid has they're likely to have obesity for the rest of their life wow. um, we have similar studies in in both dogs and cats now mainly we're talking dogs today of course that show that, that there's an association again between how fast kids uh, dogs grow and whether they're overweight early on and later so we were talking earlier about this about this business of dogs maybe growing out of it oh don't worry it's only a bit of puppy fat that isn't always necessarily the case um mm. and that worries me greatly well we were laughing about it because my mum the classic she's had four mm. children she was like oh you grow out and then you grow up mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah you know i yeah. was a plump child i'm trying to keep it under under wraps now but um 
that's quite scary. And the, the terminology, puppy fat, really plays it down, doesn't it? It really mm-hmm. kind of makes it, oh, it's okay, it's just puppy fat. Um, yes, exactly, and, it, and sadly, it's, it's not that. It, um, we know that there are multiple consequences as a result of, of having excessive body fat. Um, body fat is a fascinating tissue. Um, never used to be thought uh, of, of as such. It was just thought of as sort of as a boring energy store. But we know mm-hmm. it's an active endocrine, active hormone-producing organ, and there are multiple, multiple factors. That we call adipokines um, that help to regulate various bodily processes. Um, and the trouble with with obesity is when is the is that system goes awry, and so you get crazy signals being sent off. And that's one of the th- reasons we know there are many associated problems. And, and that I guess is why I believe personally it's a, it should be classified as a disease. Yeah. Well, I was just actually having a little in a laugh. You know when um, not about obesity, but you know when um, Vet Compass came out with their welfare issues in companion animals and for a few years before I've been saying this is a welfare concern for arthritis, this is a welfare concern, this is a worry, this is a you know, Arr! and when that came out in 2018 I was like yes I've got it, it's now classified as a welfare concern, you're right there with me, you know, um, obesity is one of the three welfare concerns for small animal um, practice isn't it? It it certainly is. It's it's one of the ones, in, and in various surveys, not not just vet compass, but in a lot of them, it's one of the one major concerns that vets have, and vet nurses for for that matter. Um, it that doesn't sadly translate into action often by by vets, and I think it's because it's a very tricky condition to manage. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity around the topic as well. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of stigma associated with obesity, both in people and actually in pets. So, um, there's a study that was out just last year showing that the degree of stigma that the owners of pets that have obesity face. Um, and I think that makes it kind of the elephant in the room a little bit in terms of managing it. And and it's it for that reason, I think we probably, as a vet profession, need to do a better job than we're doing. Yeah, and, and from a vet's perspective, though, I will also say it's such a hard topic when you have approached it, you felt you've done a good job, and then you have an owner complaint. And I will put my hands up, I've had two owner complaints about that topic, and I haven't mm-hmm. felt that I was rude. I felt that I was very polite and you know factual, and and um, then they've gone and said, well, I don't like that vet because she's told me my pet's fat. And you're like, well, I don't really want to say it again now because I don't want to be up against my boss trying to you know, substantiate why I gave that advice. It's very tricky, isn't it? it it's a very tricky topic to choose. And actually, as a result, a lot of vets choose not to say anything. Um, and I think that's kind of wrong. You, you need to have something in the middle. I think you need to just show empathy, show you care. Mm-hmm. Um, it's best one of my key rule things is to avoid the f word fat (laughs) for that matter avoid avoid the o word as well so obesity is the condition the disease but it's not an easy term it's a tricky term and people find it difficult so there are ways that the topic can be introduced without having to talk about obesity at all um Mm. uh, body condition scoring is something we many people know about and it's our way of uh, assessing body fat mass um but we can talk about body shape we can talk about changing weight and and things like that and that's a far less toxic way i guess of introducing the term another thing i think actually as a useful rule for vets um is to adopt something that's done in in people often is asking permission to talk about it That, that one of the things is you want to point it out but not not all owners are, are comfortable with that conversation at that point. So yes. having raised the topic, hopefully in a sensitive manner, you simply say, are you comfortable having a chat about this now? And an owner can then say yes or no. And it gives them yes. control. Um, if an owner, and most will generally be comfortable with it and say yes, they're then going to be more inclined to actually hopefully listen and engage with that. Um, that's yeah. not to say you won't offend people, but I think it, I think there is a responsibility for us at least to try to, you know, raise that awareness in as careful a way as we possibly can. Yeah, I love that idea. 
because I know some people go for the technique of trying to humor it and they're like oh he's getting a bit chubby isn't he and you know they're blah, 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 blah. and they just try and make it light-hearted and that can be interpreted badly or it cannot be taken seriously so it is such a difficult conversation to break well let's I tell you what we should do then I think we should jump into the underlying causes so people mm -hmm. can step away from any blame shame stigma let's look at what is happening what is underlying this epidemic proportion yeah. like um, growth in um, obesity and overweight pets um it's complicated I guess is the simple thing um that there is a simple explanation um which is is all related to energy balance ultimately weight gain and loss has to happen through any changes in energy balance that's energy intake versus uh, energy expenditure okay mm. um, and we know that from physics because we'll be familiar with the first law of thermodynamics that tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed so ma obesity doesn't magically happen and likewise uh, you, you there's a you know you, you basically you, you you can't essentially deny the fact that it's all related to energy um so that's the simple explanation too much energy in eating too much and not enough expenditure however that kind of masks what is a much much more complex issue in humans they know that there are over a hundred factors that affect that energy balance mm. um, and one of the key things that we're recognizing more and more in the human field and it looks like it's similar in dogs is is genetics right. so from the studies that have been done somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of an individual's risk of developing obesity comes from their own genes wow um and here's one of the things that many if not most of those genes are actually in the brain they just tell you all the time that you feel hungrier than average um, <laughs> oh. and so you know that that is ultimately there there's a there's a great book actually that on this topic called the hungry brain and, and it, yeah. it sums that up very much now we do know genetics has play its plays its part in um dogs um, there's one gene so far been discovered, which is the POMC gene, uh, mm -hmm. pro opio melanocortin. Um, what does that do? It affects appetite. And it was Labradors that it was found in. And, and those who own Labradors will know they are a hungry breed. Yeah, um, yeah. So ultimately, yes, everything comes down to feeding and eating, you know, consuming too much energy, not expending enough. But there's a whole lot of genetics that's going to play a part. There's a whole right. load of other environmental factors that work there. And it's that concept between genetics and environment in particular, which which where, where effectively, it, I guess it just affects the relative ease of gaining weight in an individual. Yeah. So we're saying that basically it's not, a, it, it sounds simple and sometimes we're yeah. taught it in a simple way, but actually it's not. There's so many other variants and it's not yeah. a linear curve of increased food sure. equals increased weight. Jobs are done. It's 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 never quite as simple as that. And I say that there's there's those factors. There's there's of course you know other illnesses can play a part on that energy energy balance. Arthritis, for example, we'll talk about this later. Making a dog mm -hmm. less active alters the energy balance. Other mm -hmm. illnesses like hypothyroidism play a part. If you give your dog drugs, that some drugs will increase appetite, and you know. And so mm -hmm. there's actually far far more. And that's I guess why. A lot of people very simplistic say, oh, it's the owner's fault because you just feed them less. And sadly, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's more complicated. So if you had to pick five breeds that you feel are more inclined to gain weight, what would they be? Okay, so if you'd asked me this 15, 10, 15 years ago, it's things like Lab Labrador, Golden Retriever, Beagle would probably be top of the list. Um, mm. Now, they're still up there. And again, we know that the genetics is playing a part and, and that probably highlights a lot of that. The number one breeds or the most common breeds, and the, the, this is what gives me great concern actually, are the brachycephalics now. So pugs in particular, the short-nosed dogs, we should say. Um, pugs, French bulldogs, um, and, and, and other similar dogs. Um, so they now kind of top the table in terms of the prevalence. Um, what wow. worries me about that is that they have their own associated health issues, sadly, as a result of 
of the their genetic makeup. And then if you add obesity on that particular that can affect cardiorespiratory function, heart and lung function. And that yeah. that's I guess it's and definitely the the smaller the breed, I think it's the harder it is to body condition school. I think people naturally think that they should be tub like, don't they? The, yeah, and I think those particular breeds can be problematic because they're that they're a, they're a, diff, a different conformation. So it's not just their size, but it's that you know wide-chested variety. Um, we we're very fortunate at Liverpool at our specialist clinic because we have um, a machine called a DEXA scanner, mm -hmm. uh, which which is a fancy X-ray machine effectively, but it tells us about body body fat mass and muscle mass and, and so on and so forth. So we can we can much more easily tell how overweight an individual is, whatever their shape. Um, mm. But you're right, the condition scoring systems work slightly differently. You know, a greyhound is different from a pug or a, or a mm. boxer in that respect. Um, so it does take a little bit of nuance on the part of the vet to get it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and if you haven't got like that breed familiarity in so you're stuck in a small cubicle room with no windows, you know, lacking air, you've got mm. you know, stress on every wall. Mm. And then you've got a breed that you're not familiar with and you've got a difficult conversation ahead. I can imagine, well, I, I know. You sit there going, mm -hmm. do I, do I, do I not? Or should I just stick to the vaccine? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So what other things, we talk about these other environments and we've got to talk about neutering because that is definitely something that I know just you know it's off the sheet him sheet of sure. now that you've been muted we're going to be looking at cutting back to two thirds was what i had a rule of thumb of please make a change in how much your dog now eats what's the thoughts around that yeah so so neutering is a very key one i think one of the key things is that's a known factor we know when it happens so hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about prevention later but that exactly as you said there i, I think being proactive um, in looking at the effect in an individual on 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 weight change is important. The the the, the reasons for it have been debated for for you know for a long time. Tr initially, it was thought that what happened was that the energy requirements of the of the dog went down on neutering. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like a, a their their basal metabolic rate dropped. Um, but actually, that doesn't seem to be the case. What it's thought is that the neutering um, effect actually has an impact on behavior so right. it um, increases food seeking and therefore potential for food in greater food intake and decreases physical activity so it's again it's it, it does have an effect through that energy balance um, right. but I, I think your strategy is, is exactly right in that you, you do need to adjust how much food to give that for me the best thing and I'll probably say this again later way way and way again you can't weigh your dog too you know too much yeah. maybe every day is probably a little bit um extreme but if you weigh them if you're weighing them regularly you can you can very much um spot them when there's a change yes. and if you're weighing the food as well we'll talk about that it, it shouldn't be too difficult to make an adjustment between yeah. a little bit less food because my dog's gaining weight a little bit more if they're losing weight on the scales yeah i just can yeah. remember feeling that it was a it was a very nice cut point of mm. the operation has been done and we start yeah. as we mean to carry on yeah and yeah. i found that really quite useful um but is yeah. two-thirds still an okay it, thing it's because it's, I've it's already a rough guide. It, it, it will vary i think depending on that one, one of the other challenges of course is many dogs becoming new to, getting neutered earlier in life even during growth phase mm -hmm. and it can therefore be a bit tricky because you're going to need to make adjustments during growth um again hopefully we'll talk about growth charts later but the best way of doing it is actually to be looking at the growth trajectory on the chart and if there's an upwards turn after neutering you you drop it down um and so and, and i says so that that sort of two-thirds is is probably sort of reasonable as, as as an average but you might find that some need a little bit more a little bit less um yeah. i'm all for tailoring to the individual if if at all possible yeah yeah definitely okay yeah. so still on causal factors we've now yeah. got to talk about the stuff that's going to dabble with the blame section which we don't want to be which is the, the owner factors and right what mm. it for them. it's true isn't it the, they 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 there's an association there. So, I mean, one of the things, again, we should really be thinking about of obesity as a family issue because mm -hmm. obesity tends to run in, in, in families. Um, 
there there's uh, it's a, a sad fact that that children born to people that have obesity that parents have obesity are likely to develop obesity themselves mm -hmm. um there are also studies that show that um dogs in particular that are owned by people with obesity are more likely to have a higher body condition score there's a there's an association now with the first ex ex um, example of children obviously genetics is going to play a big part but it's not just that it's also what people refer to as the family food environment mm -hmm. it, it's the it's the sort of attitudes and um, behaviors rec regarding not just food but also activity and and, and lifestyle um, now whilst genetics obviously doesn't play a part between in the link between owner and dog um, there are those similar sort of family lifestyle issues most people see their dogs as a as a child as another child you know? um, and so it's not surprising that effectively it's a family unit um, right. so that's very complicated you know there's a whole lot then it, and, and so straight away we, we're dealing not just with an isolated dog and and and, and uh, you know and that's it but it's essentially a family unit that we're we, we, we're trying to I guess we're, what we're trying to do when we're helping with weight management is, is is we're trying to sort of benefit that whole unit in some way yeah okay and then what part of the feeding regime can we kind of say oh it's just the treats or it's the, just the quotient of food or it needs us nicely or no we're going to talk about different types of food later but let's stick to <laughs> treats or food I think treating has to yeah. be dealt with um, I think yeah I mean I think at the end of the day the food is of is partly main meal and partly treats and extras mm -hmm. um, and in terms of associations there are you know there have been various studies and the, and the studies are inconsistent for dogs as to whether a particular type of food is a particular risk different people have their opinions I think too much of any food is one of the what is one of the key things what whatever the food is but there hasn't been a particular association in dogs with a particular type of food as of yet mm. um the the treats and the extras um one of the one of the challenges with those is that most owners do don't see them as food because they see them as very small extra food and it's inconsequential um mm. and so con it's usually they're, they're meeting the requirements you with a main meal and all of those are then on top of that food so it, so it's always extras um and if you particularly if you've got a small dog um what we may think of as a tiny little piece of cheese is equivalent to a much larger block and so i think people probably don't realize that those treats and extras add up um mm. obesity is not a condition that develops overnight it happens very slowly so it doesn't take much of a of, 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 of a, a, a portion beyond what they need over time to, to start playing its part. Yeah, and I definitely read somewhere that the treat industry has gone through the roof in the last five to ten years. Like, you know, no longer is it just a section of a pet shop, it is the pet shop. And the marketing and the strategies and the colour schemes and the way that they're promoted, they've been normalised that you are expected to treat your pets whereas when i grew up you know my mom and dad very strict very strict the dog would get fed at that point of the day and that was it and there wasn't all these tidbits and treats and these added purchases but now there is definitely a feeling that when you buy your food you buy some more don't you or please disagree with me but that's what i've kind of got impression of the, um i think it is a, it's a growing area um now i think treating as a natural part of of pet ownership and i certainly wouldn't want to discourage that because it's one of the ways we show our our love i think for me the main thing is we need to keep it in proportion um and i think i agree with that there's a lot of extras out there which are you know unnecessary and that they're not necessarily going to supply a lot of essential nutrients but they're just designed almost to be our, our way of showing love you know that things like the the Porsecco for dogs or, you know, and, and doggy beer and all of these, you know, and uh, which, which I think is, you know, that's where it's probably taking it a step too far. The classic rule for me, if I, if I'm giving people advice on treats is to limit them to a maximum of 10% of a, of a dog's activity. You need to take them in, into account. So you need to feed less of your main meal if you're feeding treats, but keep it to less than 10%. Um, one of the things I'm 
one of my major rules for nutrition is to ensure that you're feeding something that's complete and balanced. Mm -hmm. And most commercial diets have a safety net of about 10%. So if you're feeding 90% of what you should feed and then 10% of treats, the diet should still remain in balance from a nutrient mm -hmm. point of view. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's the excess, I think, which is the worry rather than a particular type of treat, just like it's not necessarily a particular type of food if you're ensuring you're feeding the right amount and you're weighing it out. OK, so we can we can take a good a take home from that because I know it's a, it's a contentious, mm -hmm. emotional issue. There mm -hmm. isn't a specific source of food that's causing this because there was somebody earlier that said is it because loads of sugars and fats are being dumped into cheap pet foods and all of this sort of thing um we will come back to some key questions and phrases later but it isn't there isn't it isn't the kibble crisis you know it isn't the raw food crisis it isn't the treat crisis it's just a combination of everything and too much I, th I think it, I think it's fair to say that there's not. I think one of the things is whenever anybody tries to say there's a simple answer to the story of obesity, a simple cause, there's one thing, one nutrient, then it's normally one of three things: one, they're lying; two, they're they're stupid; or three, they're selling you something. So often there's, there's a there's a motive to to some of these. Um, <laughs> When it comes to if you if you look at you know there's not going to be a single factor there's over a hundred different factors involved and various nutrients have been looked at uh, over the years and it's never one thing so historically people will be familiar with the fact that we it was it was always saturated fat was the big demon to, to human health in the 70s that's what led to obesity so low you know go low fat go low fat despite that prevalence of obesity in people increased mm -hmm. um the the recent message about it all being sugar this is now the big thing from a human point of view people actually if you look at the figures have been eating less sugar in the usa for over 20 years yet the prevalence of obesity is increasing so if it is just sugar or just fat then it doesn't it, it certainly doesn't fit the explanations it also that the, the fact if you look at outcomes with weight weight loss diets so you, you go low carb versus low fat in the best conducted randomized controlled trials there's actually no difference in outcome with the different macronutrients so to me it anytime anyone says it's just one thing it's just x it's just y or a particular diet um sadly it's it's far far more complicated than that yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Too, too much of any food uh, is, is going to be a problem. That, that's that's too kind much, of a thing. Too much yeah. red wine, too much chocolate. <laughs> My problem. Too C bad. Certainly not not chocolate for dogs, as I'm sure we all know. Um, we all know that. <laughs> um, so something I think is brilliant that Gemma's just put this up because I think we need to get this point made clear because Luke very. Um, shortly before I'd said I knew weight was a problem but it's really hammering it home to me now and Gemma's mm -hmm. quite rightly but actually it's really bad because of that two-year lifespan study Do the, you want to tell me about that? yeah so the, the the one that people always quote is it was actually a it was a colony study so it was done in um in a group of Labrador dogs and they were actually fed for the whole of their life it was a very exciting you know it's like it's a very brave study to do because it took so long to to to, to run um and basically that some some of the labradors were ad lib fed and others were paired to them and restricted to 75 percent of what the pair dog ate and that yeah. was the, the key finding which is over that lifespan there, there was an average of two year difference between the ad lib ones that on body condition score were overweight and the restricted fed ones that were sort of condition score four five out of nine perfect weight and so they lived two years longer um we've d recently last year or two ago we published a study looking at pet dogs because the limitation of that study is it's it was a colony study in research dogs and you think well yeah. th does that relate to dogs with, that are overweight so we looked at um over fifty four thousand dogs in the us um and they're wow. from their medical records um this was done in collaboration with with Waltham uh, and Banfield, and uh, we we compared dogs in twelve different breeds, that some that were sort of overweight or others in a at a healthy weight, and there was a similar difference in lifespan. It varied depending on the breed, interestingly, 
Mm-hmm. So bigger breed dogs like German Shepherds, it was the, the effect was slightly less. It was about sort of six months, I think, shorter on average. Mm-hmm. For smaller dogs, it was up to two, two and a half years shorter. Was it so, what do I remember rightly? Was it Daxon? Uh, I'm not sure. If, I can't remember if Daxon was one of them. Yorkshire Terrier was the was had the shortest mm-hmm. of, of all, but there was a whole range of different breeds we did look at. Um, so it, that I think it. it you know extends those previous studies because it shows it's various breeds and it's also these were dogs that were identified as as being overweight um and so that does give us an, a clear sort of association between that and and lifestyle i mean it, for me people love their pets and their dogs and they want to be with them for as long as possible they want them to live a long happy life and keeping them an ideal weight for me is one of the best strategies and one of the best things we can do for our dogs. Yeah, definitely. And I think that study, the, the, the um, colony study, leads us very nicely into our next part, next section, which okay. is obesity and musculoskeletal disease, because that study was epic with mm-hmm. what they found with that way, didn't they? Uh, yes, yes. So that was one of the other th- things. It was the shortened lifespan and much greater risk of various comorbidities, other diseases, particularly osteoarthritis um, of various joints they found and not just that it wasn't just dogs that that were in the sort of ad lib overweight condition had more sort of more arthritis they had more joints affected with arthritis as well so it was multi-limb arthritis which which was um you know so it, it that and for us and certainly in our clinic that's the number one association that we see so we, when we look at our dogs we've got to, had over 400 dogs um through our clinic so far three quarters of them have another illness or more than one illness and basically two-thirds to three quarters of those it's basically orthopedic problems musculoskeletal problems um so it's a really big association and a concern for us yeah and i know um we're talking about how much we love our dogs and as owners you know price point shouldn't come into it but i'm afraid it does we wouldn't like to talk about it but these dogs were being put on medication earlier as well. So there was the huge expense mm-hmm. and yeah. potentially adverse events of that. So everything about it's negative. Everything yeah. is negative about carrying and, it to the point. And there are studies looking at costs. I mean, some of the insurance companies have done studies, but also there are some publications showing that actually it has a burden. And it, it's for those sort of reasons, because you're having to give other medications and, and various other things. I can't remember the exact figures, but I think it increased up about 20 25 oh, I, go on it was it was 17 to 53 percent um, what i read and <laughs> that enough. was like it was just the huge expense mm. of having an overweight dog and not just the cost of food we're just talking about the illness and secondaries yeah. mm-hmm. shocking mm-hmm. isn't it um so can you explain to us about how it isn't just the mechanical weight carriage because everybody's going to immediately just think it's saddlebags of fat that is causing more mechanical forces to go through those joints and affect the cartilage but what do we actually know about the metabolic nature of of fat yeah it's i think it's probably fair to say that joint loading excess joint loading is one of the bits of the story so it is thought it's partly mechanical Mm-hmm. Um, but we, it was a little bit what we talked about earlier. We talked about adipose tissue being an active endocrine organ. So it produces a whole heap of uh, cytokines and inflammatory factors. Um, so the studies that have been done in p- people in particular have shown associations between production of those factors and the um the uh, risk of things like arthritis or or other diseases so it's i think it goes beyond it just being a, a joint you know like a mechanical joint loading excess joint loading issue um mm. it also i guess explains why in people for example um people that have obesity or have a greater risk of having wrist arthritis and that of course isn't a weight bearing joint um mm. So I guess we're thinking things like TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, but other these factors that they they are likely to lead to a degree of inflammation, and we don't know quite how. But the suspicion then is that that contributes to the severity of arthritis there. Yeah. Okay. So I can remember. I think it was David Dykus who was talking about hip dysplasia, and he was saying that um, it isn't that the weight carriage will create 
the arthritis, there's got to be a seed already there. So there's going to be a dysplastic joint. There's going to be some kind of joint incongruity. But then the fat is just like, let's bring it on. I, I think I think it's yeah I think that's fair to say one of the things just going back to the um the, the studies we talked about the lifelong feeding studies um hip dysplasia early in life was one of the other risk factors in the ad lib fed group um and so that was so probably both yeah so so yeah so that may as you I think you're right and again I know less about arthritis than I do about obesity but um that I think you know, I agree with that fact. That there needs to be. There's almost got to be some kind of trigger to to it developing. So it may be that there's an association there. The other thing, of course, we know is that if if we have a, a dog that has obesity and also gets arthritis, then the mobility, you know, effects kick in, and that can yeah. then exacerbate any weight gain. And so, you know, then the, both the are there. So I think it's kind of complicated in terms of chicken and egg and, and which one's yeah. causing which and potentially an overlap of like the genetics because i can remember we had mike farrell on as a guest and he was saying mm. that hip dysplasia is, is a genetic switch it's happening around about 12 weeks and then that's when you start to see the signs of dysplastic changes happening and then um, mm. as you say with obesity as well so complex is what i say <laughs> yeah. uh, um so i'm glad that you talked about the non-weight bearing you know arthritis in the wrist because i think a lot of people really need to hear that because they just think saddlebags are fat saddlebags are fat mm -hmm. we had a really epic guest a lady called heli who did a um she did a lecture about the biomechanics of obesity and she did a literature search and she'd only found like three papers that she could um relate to to create this lecture and about lipid infiltration into tendons affecting mm -hmm. their strength range of motion of the joints changed with obese dogs having a greater range of motion for normal movement so the mm -hmm. joint was put through more range of motion abnormal movement so it's just like oh, biomechanical you know you've got your range of motion and you've got your inflammatory nature it's just a no-no yeah. just a no no okay so weight management strategies and benefits so okay. we're going to have some people that are going to go oh god i don't <laughs> Oh, wait, what am I going to yeah. do? When do we start? Okay, so it's, we, we talked earlier, I guess, about the simple cause of obesity, although, you know, I've emphasised the fact, hopefully squash the myth that it is anything but simple. But that's related ultimately to energy balance. All weight gain and weight loss happens through that. So I guess our job when we're trying to help an owner of a dog who has obesity is to see if we can shift and alter that energy balance, almost turn it in on itself if you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying. So we we basically, the two areas that we can impact are food intake and activity. And so on the one hand, we're reducing food intake. On the other hand, we're hopefully helping to increase physical activity. Um, okay. So that's the, the key strategy. Um, if you were to ask me what's most important, decreasing food intake, increasing activity, over 90% of the battle is decreasing food intake that has yeah. the greatest effect it's like in people actually that there's a well-known saying you know you can't outrun a bad diet um effectively sadly physical activity is very limited in its ability to help you burn calories um the classic chocolate example is what i always tell people so 100 grams of chocolate i mean do you, you like chocolate we've agreed that already but 100 grams of chocolate 500 calories now that takes me under a minute normally to eat because it's not a lot yeah. and that's basically um two and a half hours of walking <laughs> and the really <laughs> depressing thing the really depressing thing is if you if i stood still for that time i'd have burned almost half those calories anyway yeah well do you know what? this makes me laugh total tangent i um, i love snowboarding and I, mm -hmm. I can remember the amount of times that you're snowboarding and you're going, oh, I really deserve this big pint of beer and this big yeah. cheese roasty. Totally mm -hmm. burn that off. You're like, yeah. I've come from holiday really quite off. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, which, but we've, all, we've all, all, done, all done that. And there's various other ways that exercise is not perfect. But so really the key thing is eating less. And we usually do that with providing 
a, a special diet, a therapeutic diet, which is designed to help dogs lose weight. Um, yeah. So I guess that's the overall plan. It, time is the is the is the other thing so our typical plan at our clinic is about nine months to right. to, to return a, a dog hopefully to its ideal weight or its, to its target weight um but we've had some that lose weight very very slowly over two or three years um and actually weight management is a lifelong thing anyway because it's, it's not just the weight loss bit people always like lose weight then job done but there's we know in dogs that there's a 50 percent chance of regain after hitting a target um it's again similar to to, to people um so really yeah, it's a yeah. it's like it's loss and then and then you battle about trying to keep it off and i'd say keeping it off is more important whatever you've lost yeah okay so there's definitely going to be a big following here so we're really lucky we have lots of people from different parts of the globe at this mm -hmm. now and some of them won't have easy access to the vets or they might actually mm -hmm. as we said feel a bit socially inhibited about going they feel embarrassed they're a bit mm -hmm. being uncomfortable if they chose to go it alone okay um so say we've got somebody from nova scotia listening and they've body condition scored a dog and they've gone yeah i'm gonna be honest myself we're six seven out of nine and they what would the sort of thing that you'd say to somebody in that category then we'll go to somebody that's more able to utilize resources that are available to them okay very good question um so at the sort of six and possibly seven out of nine uh we did a recent study where we we know that you can you should be able to achieve some modest weight loss or weight reduction by just reducing the amount of the current food that that uh, that animal's on, particularly if they're on one of the sort of light diets, you know, that the sort of lower calorie versions of many diets, which many companies will will, will have, um, so you can restrict them slightly. So typically, we would be feeding them about eighty percent of what they actually needed uh, for their for their perfect weight. So so you, you need to work out what their ideal weight is. And rather than feeding the full amount on that, you feed about 80% of that. Right. And we could, you can often get some success, 5% 5, 5 up to 10% weight loss that way. Yeah. Um, the key thing, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is that it, the diet stays in balance with that. It comes back to the, the nutrients energy. When, when, with a food, you're delivering essential nutrients, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and so on and so forth, and energy um and by restricting to that amount about 80 percent is about the maximum you can do the diets should just about still be meeting those essential nutrients right. okay. okay so that i guess i would think about what diet they're on maybe see if they can transition to a, to a, a light diet um i'd get them to weigh out the food and try with their current diet and see how they got on um and of course in it's regularly weighing their, their their dog they need to every couple of weeks um yeah cutting out the treats and extras which is um you know as, what about as we've people about with um body tapes i know that that used to be done a lot in um nurse clinics so this lady in nova scotia hasn't got bathroom scales yeah. can you okay. achieve anything with a body tape um you can some that they're not tape isn't perfect um we, we do use it for monitoring our our patients as well particularly sort of the measurements around the chest and abdomen are pretty good for showing it but one of the challenges with it is consistency with how tight you're yeah. pulling it that yeah. there are some there are some specialist ones where where they've got a little pulley mechanism so you can make sure you do but even then you may not be putting it in quite the same place each time um we one of the things that um we we sometimes do if we can use it as well as a help as a way of maintaining motivation so if the scales haven't moved, you can pull the tape slightly tighter and you feel there's a change. So the, it's not not imperfect. It's, I think it's a use, you know, that's a, it's a useful thing. Prob for me, though, weighing is by far and away the most precise way. Um, okay. If they haven't got bathroom scales, then if they've got one of those little luggage weigher things and it's a small dog, putting them in a pet carrier and weighing them and the pet carrier uh, we use that quite a lot for our remote clinics because at the moment we, we can't see cases because of COVID. So we're doing a lot of remote Zoom consultations okay. and that's how that's how we get our weight measurements. Yes. I think in, and on a practical sense, I would also say the whole family's got to be involved. It's terrible yeah, when grandma's yes. still giving rich tea biscuits, you know, 
Um, and also making like a chart. So you've got that kind of motivation chart that's stuck to the fridge to remind you what you're doing and get rid of the treat cupboard or, you know, try and really downsize the temptation. And it's, I sure. found with some of my owners that if the treats are in the treat box, they have this special box. It's all psychology, isn't it? There's mm -hmm. this treat box and you put a little quotient of their yeah. daily intake in there, but it's coming yeah. out the street, treat box as a treat. Yeah. Little trickeries that you can play with yourself. The, I think treats, are, yeah, there's, I mean, we, we talked about earlier, it's the number one way we, we show love, but there's various other ways of doing it. And, and the treat doesn't have to be something different or, or calories, as you say, it can just be the same food. The mm -hmm. dog, for the dog, it's the act of receiving the treat, which is the big thing. Um, yeah. So I think that's great. Keeping the whole family on board, I think, is very important. Weighing the food out using kitchen scales, not measuring cups because they're sadly they're imprecise and they tend to lead to over treating um, and over feeding. Um, making use of a lot of the puzzle feeders. We one of the things is you're going to be feeding less. They're going to feed hungry, so you can slow them down. There's various toys and devices. Again, it's another a bit like the treats. It's a growth area. There's so many different devices. And dogs love it. Um, yeah. Here's a Go word to the for cam you. Shop, there. Everybody online, yeah. cam online shop. We don't sell therapies. We don't sell any supplements or drugs or any foods. We sell yeah. products like slow uh, yeah. feeders. <laughs> Perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. D cool. Dogs are dogs are contra freeloaders. If you knew that, I, didn't, I bet you didn't know that. No. <laughs> so that basically means, given the choice, they prefer to work for food than to have it free. Ooh. contra freeloaders yeah get that into a conversation that. later yeah but that that's they that's is why they actually so much they love working for food um yeah, yeah. there's nothing yeah. to say we should feed dogs in bowls um do you know what? i love that so. because i was going to tell you that if i go out of luna and um so if i put some of her kibble in in a bowl she's like yeah whatever if i go out and mm. play with the food oh my god this yeah. food and it really <laughs> is different and I, I can't remember but there was i'm sure there was a study where they were looking at the act of giving compared to the actual treat, and they found that the dogs were having as much pleasure from the interaction as they did actually from yeah. the morsel of food. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of the study itself, but yeah, that's certainly um, from my understanding of that. Yes, um, and there's very yeah, the, there's various other bits about that. It's that it's kind of like a Pavlov effect almost, isn't it? I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Which um, type of diet is best for obesity or weight management? Yeah. So we, we talk very much about the sort of, you know, what the choice for, for a slightly overweight dog. And I think you can probably stick with your same diet and, and, and adjust it. Um, if you're dealing with dogs that are sort of eight or nine out of nine, so they've been the obese category, um, one of the problems is the degree of restriction you need to achieve success is is it, it means that the, a standard diet won't be complete and balanced. Mm -hmm. So if we think about um, diets, they're packed with with nutrients and, and energy. So what we would use is a what we call a therapeutic weight loss diet. So they have more of the essential nutrients and less of the energy. Mm -hmm. Typically, we're feeding at our clinic somewhere about 50 to 60 percent of their needs on an energy basis. Yeah. But by using the therapeutic diet, you can ensure they still get all of the other essentials. OK, yeah. so for me, I'm not going to give you particular products, but but anything that is a therapeutic weight loss diet. So it is best one that you you get in and you work with your vet for. Right. Um, okay. And then just finally, those diets have more protein and fiber typically in them. And those things can help to satisfy the dog, make them feel full. So you're cutting the calories, but they won't realize. Yes, I think that's really cool. And we were talking to Cecilia for two hours on Tuesday. <laughs> and um, I know there's a real tendency for people to add things like tinned pumpkin and lots of green veggies and things like that. What do you think about that kind of strategies? Um, I guess mo it comes back to balance. Um, one of the things that th is if, you, if you're adding lots of other things, there's a danger that the diet itself, which has been formulated to be balanced, then becomes un unbalanced. Yeah. Um, I would say that the best 
therapeutic diets on the market have the benefits of the pumpkin and, and other things as well because yeah. they've got typically fibers like psyllium which is a very good fiber that binds water in it that's why it sort of helps to to provide stomach fill okay so i i, I think I, i'm not a great fan of adding vegetables for the sake of it however um one of my top tips if if as treats is courgette or zucchini and this, this works for cats and dogs i know we're talking about dogs tonight but wow. cats will eat that so cooked you just need to sort of microwave it or something like that and and the beauty of of courgette is it's very low in calories really low yeah. so so although you technically you should take into account you can pretty much feed extra what you want and it's not a great burden um okay. And you can use that as the treats and the extras. Um, I've got, I, I know a dog that um, it's, a, it's actually a little puppy is growing and, and has, has courgette, has about half a courgette a day, loves it as a treat. Um, wow. And, it's not because so, I know everybody talks about carrots all the time. Yeah. I, yeah. Carrots aren't bad. And most, you know, vegetables as treats aren't, aren't bad. The trouble with carrots is they're slightly higher in calories. They've got a little bit more sugar in them. Um, courgette right. is basically water um and it's it's pretty good it's very safe it's not you're not going to do a lot of harm feeding courgette um yeah. there as well so that would be if we had dogs where the diets themselves aren't doing enough to control the sort of hunger then it's often something that courgette would be what we would choose yeah what about okay this is totally daft and this is totally <laughs> you can tell me off for this but um i used to use um home cooked popcorn um mm -hmm. <laughs> daft enough i used to um <laughs> Polly used to have games and I used to float it on water and she used to kind of like be trying to get popcorn. It kept her entertained for ages. Any reason not to use something like that? I, I think as long as you measure the amounts out so you know how much you're giving, shouldn't be too yeah. much of a problem. I suppose if there's a lot of salt there, that's another thing just to bear oh, no. in mind. You're, you know, but, for the, um, the but not yeah. anything from a packet. Oh, that, that's, I mean, so that, I think in that respect, it's, it's pretty low calorie. It's, it's filled with air. A lot of what sat it what fills a dog up or a person up is actually volume so mm -hmm. because that's expanded it's it's a i would say that would be a better treat than a, an energy dense treat like treat like cheese for example um yeah. some of the the sort of newer formulations of of kibble diets um actually are expanded so they're they're, they're sort of slightly more filled with air and there's others now with different shapes again to sort of slow intake so you know the popcorn thing i think it, it, as long as we sort of keep it in in proportion so we're not unbalancing it and and, yeah. and keeping you know and taking those calories off perfect you know that that would yeah. be a reasonable solution cool. i still think so, courgette's best but that's just i, know, I love courgette i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> somebody, somebody yeah. ask very very simply is it raw or is it cooked or does it matter it could be either dogs will eat anything um generally um so it could be either um cats we typically cook it but um i think most dogs probably prefer it if it's my you know microwaved or, or there i wouldn't you know don't don't fry it or anything like that because you've got your no. calories that way you know <laughs> deep, <laughs> deep fried tempura courgette is not what we're dealing with we, um no no yeah. okay <laughs> So now we're getting onto the topic that I think is close to our heart. I'm just trying to think of all these other things. We did, I had a ridiculous <laughs> list of that. I came prepared. But um, time <laughs> is on. this is the topic that is really important, prevention. And something that really makes me happy is that CAM's grown since 2016 when it kind of got launched. We now have nearly 36,000 followers on this page. and. I have 6,000 owners in another group and 5,000 in another group. It's fantastic. But what's mm. lovely about it is people want to go, well, what can be done better next time? So mm. a lot of the owners that have gone on their arthritis journey, they are where they are, they're coping, they're like, well, I don't want to be here again. Mm. How can I prevent OA next time? So they want to know about what to do with puppies. So let's talk about that. Prevention. <laughs> Yes, I mean, you know, there's the old adage, prevention is better than cure, um, which I, th I think we probably would agree. Um, one of the challenges we have with, with obesity is that it happens and starts very early in life. Um, it, if you remember at the start of this conversation, we talked about the fact that we know in growing dogs now in the UK, 37% are above their ideal weight already. Um, and we know that it's, you know, that those, those, um, dogs are going to likely to have an issue for the rest of their life come come what may 
so for me that the first thing is we need to start early so prevention of obesity is something where i guess we're looking at the puppies and the dogs of the future um the you know prevent uh, and what we do for obviously for the for the dogs that already have problems is we do our best to care for them and improve their health um and make them as comfortable as possible but i think prevention is is for puppies okay so i guess what we've got to try and do is we firstly got to know our risk factors mm. so that we can spot obesity before it's going to develop mm. um and we talked about some of those risk factors earlier breed neutering certain owner factors potentially as well could all play a part in there so for example if we have a as a vet or an owner if we have a puppy that we know has a predisposition for obesity such as the labrador retriever or a pug then straight away we need to be thinking about okay i need to be starting to put in measures early on to mm -hmm. to, to resolve that um likewise neutering as you say you know either cutting the food automatically as you said or or monitoring the weight afterwards and adjusting food i think is important Mm -hmm. um one of the things i think which is particularly helpful is something that we help to develop which are puppy growth charts um so people who if if, if many of your followers are parents they'll be familiar with the sort of world health organization growth charts for kids and they're a great tool of monitoring development so a, a health professional can can weigh a child regularly to see are they growing at an appropriate rate um we've developed a similar thing for puppies they're, they're freely available if people like to google puppy growth chart you can download an appropriate chart for your size of, of dog um i've got it here you tell me that i need to yeah. look at waltham puppy growth chart and i'll put a link but, below yeah so if, if they i mean if you look at that you'll you, you find and, there, there's, and there's some guidance how you do it so basically what happens is during that period from sort of initial vaccinations through to to adulthood you you basically weigh your dog regularly it's best done with a with a vet and in conjunction with a vet because they can guide you and effectively they should be tracking on one of the curves on the on the chart they're called centile lines there's mm -hmm. not a right child curve it, 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 some dogs obviously stature wise are smaller than others others are heavier so they'll start at different points but they yeah. should broadly follow the lines on the chart um, if they're crossing centiles upwards, then we worry that they're growing too fast. They're going to be at risk, of course, of development diseases of their skeleton, as yes. well as developing obesity. So for me, I think probably if people wanted to do one new thing as a puppy, it would be Love starting it. with charts, weigh it. And that also then gets you into the habit of weighing your, your dog. Yeah. So the, the second point which goes on from that is you weigh, weigh your dog all the time, um, uh, I, you know, as I say, you can't, you can do this as, as regularly as you want, but particularly through adulthood, once you get them to their perfect weight at, at early adulthood, record that, you know, let's imagine they get their two years of age or 18 months and they're 20 kilos. That's the weight they should maintain then from then on during their mm -hmm. adult weight. And if you're noticing they're 21, 22, take steps then to adjust your food. And it's just way, way and way again. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's that was interesting because um, going right back to the beginning, this is a challenge that both vets and owners need to face together. This is a team approach. There's no one party to blame. And I think us vets, we really need to be conscious of writing down the body condition score and the body weight on every consult so you can actually track mm -hmm. as well. And yeah. it's, it's terrible when you've got an animal come in and you go, oh, I don't know what they were before, so do I bring this up now? Or has somebody said something in the past or is this what they've always been and how yeah. is it going to look bad on my colleagues if i bring it up if five people haven't ah! if it's written yeah. in the notes it's yeah. it's really useful and to talk about it openly what's your yeah. thoughts on um canine professionals being involved in this as well so us vets we do have a tendency to go oh see a vet go see a vet go see a vet when actually i quite believe that there's people very very capable of doing this as well and one of the things that um, cam is really aware of is teaching owners about the likelihood of arthritis how it's likely to appear and the fact that it can appear at any age and that can be done at puppy parties that can be done in early adolescent training 
and these are done by non-veterinary professionals but canine professionals do you think the canine professionals can step forward grab this and run with it I, I don't see why not. I think it would be a perfectly reasonable thing. If, if anybody's out there and they're interested, get them to contact me and I could certainly help. I, I think I, I'm very much for that. I mean, to be honest, um, you know, for me, I'm an advocate of vet nurses because I think they, if, if I'm being honest, do a much better job of managing <laughs> obesity than vets do. Um, and there's a whole lot of other, I think, animal professionals that will have a particular and a keen interest in there. And recognizing the fact that owners do go to different places for advice i, I absolutely i think I, I'm, I'm very much in, in favor of yeah, that sort of thing give me an idea because there's a lot <laughs> there's there's definitely a hundred times more canine professionals out there working day in day out with the animals that we actually only see maybe four times a year if we're lucky twice a year through most of their sure. life and I just think there's a, there's a real area that we can, as vet professionals, kind of transfer the torch and say, right, come on, let's do this yeah. together. I, I, cool. think, I think as long as the guidance is appropriate and is right, I think that's the key thing, and which is yeah. why I'd be more than happy to help anybody who wanted, <laughs> who wanted some guidance yeah. on that. Oh, you're giving me ideas. Don't offer <laughs> what you can't. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. So I think we've we've covered quite a lot. I'm just going to look back through some questions. There weren't too many questions. We do need to talk a bit about neutering um, because that always creates a little bit of hoo-ha. People are a little bit kind of the vet profession needs too early and it's a cut and dry, we do it too early and that's the case. But um with regards to weight gain, and um, what's your view on the neutering? Should it be delayed till they're? Inter does it have any impact? Interesting. So um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the growth charts when we developed them, because we didn't have separate charts for neutered dogs. Because what we found was if if we what we, in order to generate them, we use a lot of data from dogs that were in ideal condition throughout the first three years of their life. And so we were able to chart how they, they developed. Um, and what we found was that, that, that neutering in dogs actually only had a very minor effect during the growth period. Um, earlier neutering tended to lead to a slight upwards inclination in the curve. Mm -hmm. Later neutering, so this is sort of beyond, the, you know, to, towards the skeletal maturity, there was a slight downward drop interestingly so it was different at the different points of the of the chart but it was very minor for, for a dog cats are different earlier neutering in cats seems to be not such a good thing because it does lead to more of a weight gain from various studies so i think my take-home message is that um uh, there is a risk from it we know it may it's it's the amount i guess is different in dogs perhaps than than cats but i think it's it's different in an indiv in individual dogs which is why i think i would advocate regular monitoring of weight or growth yeah if it's if it's during growth and adjusting um i i'm not going to sort of get into the issue about whether you should uh, neuter early or later because i think there are different health benefits and, and pros and cons but simply from a, a weight perspective I'm glad um, that you said that because somebody did write, oh, you know, and I'm not going to put their name up, but shame on vets for metering early. And um, I just want to kind of like say, A, we, we don't shame on anyone on CAM. You know, we don't blame owners. We don't yep. blame vets. We're trying to tackle this together. Yep. But I can remember when I came out of university and I did go to lots and lots of CPD. I'm very dedicated. And I went to one um, lecture that was talking about neutering mm -hmm. and the pros and cons. And it was listed and different forms of cancer yeah. that are associated with early neutering compared to late neutering, yeah. um, different forms of bone diseases, etc. And the, the list was very balanced. Um, yeah. There wasn't one that you could go, oh, right, early neutering is just damn it. Um, yeah. So I think when people say shame on you know early neutering, I think there is a lot more to it. And, that, you know, science is always changing. Science is always changing. I know that there's definitely more of a, a push to late neutering now but i can remember back in those early days it wasn't ignorance that was making me make that choice it was an educated decision i mean uh, yeah i think it is and i think the exact the example you know one of the classic examples is the risk of um, mammary tumors mammary cancer the earlier you knew to the less the risk and the the benefits sort of diminish as you go on so i guess you could say that's one that would be in the camp of earlier neutering 
but then equally you've got some of those other slightly negative you know negative effects that people might suggest from the from the point of view of very early nutrition one of the ones would be um you know underdeveloped i'm gonna be rude now external genitalia which i had, had a case i saw last week where that's an issue with the potentially associated with earlier neutering as well so i don't think there's a right answer for that all i'm saying i guess from the growth point of view is that the effects are slightly different at different you know the uh, different age ages um but i think dogs are individuals and any adjustments say to feeding to prevent obesity need to be on an individual basis yeah well alex i think you've just stitched yourself up because there has been nothing but i'm in i'm in i'm in i do i actually really do believe this so we released a course not long ago called cam advocate level one because we're cam and we've got cam doctors and our yeah. own sort of campaigners and so we've got cam advocates which are canine professionals that want to know more so that they can play their part yeah and i've had loads of people write actually i'd really like to know more about this because of my role in dog care i am an advocate for the dog maybe it's a way forward maybe we should step outside of just training veterinary professionals and start going right let's do a nutrition obesity course for canine professionals to take forth yeah, yeah, I think I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you have answered everybody's questions because I actually haven't got too many. So you've obviously been extraordinarily <laughs> thorough. <laughs> have you got time for the ten top tips? I, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I know my number one already, but I don't know if I should leave it till last or start at number no, ten. It's a big one. You better leave it to last because you've got number one. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. I'm going, okay. I'm going to start with number ten, and then it's nine. <laughs> so number ten for me. Okay. I say it every time: more rugs, less drugs, guys. Um, if only I can find my fairy godfather that will fund a PhD to actually prove the impact of environment on pain, because we know, we know, but it would be lovely to get some science behind it. There is definitely, definitely strong reasons to make sure the environment that your dog lives in is safer because they are less able to cope with the slips, trips and spools. Number nine. <laughs> Number nine. Actually, I'm going to change my order because I think this fits in very well. Um, weight loss is the most successful treatment for arthritis from scientific studies. It so is. Uh, and we, what we know, and the beauty is not only a little bit of weight loss works so we know six to nine percent for example of weight loss is enough to, sh to show measurable benefits to mobility um, and that's actually superior to, to drugs and other things um, as well so I think that kind of chimes up because what you can get you can get away with less drugs as well as well as them being fitter and healthier and happier so that's my number <laughs> you're gonna have to come up with something more rugs less drugs it's gonna be like Things away. But I'm glad that you said that because I'm going to go right back to the beginning of CAM. The beginning of CAM, I was sat in a small cafe in London with a couple of really um, prominent people in the industry. And I was thinking, God, we're getting really caught up with all of this newfound, newfound angles, this expensive interplay, you know, really complex science. Like, are we doing the basics right yet? You know, weight yeah. loss is available to everyone and we haven't got that down yet. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number eight. Um, Interactive feeders. I love them. <laughs> I love them. Um, I really don't see why we feed dogs in bowls. And I look back and I think Holly used to finish her meal and be like, that's it. That, that was the highlight of the day. That was over and done with. So I love snuffle mats. I've just been using the pick pocket with Luna. I put her kibble in loads of little pockets, wrap it up, hide it, and she's took ages to find it. Do not feed your dog in a bowl if you don't have to. You know, explore, try new things. Number seven. Yeah, that would have been one of mine, but you so you've stolen it shamelessly, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I'm gonna come back to one we talked about already, courgette. I think you know, as a as a treat or as as an extra, I think it's I think that's great. Um and, and well I'd love to see how what people think, but I I haven't yet met a dog that doesn't like it. Cool, so, we're gonna go courgette. Again, treat. Number, six, number six is a little bit <laughs> off tangent for me. Please think about traveling with your dogs, okay? So I've said this quite before. Um, when you have pain, you don't want unpredictable movements. It's, it's you guard against it. And, you know, I think to myself, I've got bad back at the moment. Someone put me in a boot and didn't allow me to predict when it's gonna turn, when it's gonna break, when it's gonna go forward. So think about how you travel with your dog and make sure it's comfortable, make sure there's bolsters that they can lean into 
make sure it's safe. Number five. Okay, very. That's very good. So I'm, I'm, gonna tr I'm trying to match yours for theme. So physical activity. I did sort of say earlier that that of course for weight loss, um, diet's ninety percent. That doesn't mean to say physical activity is not important. Um, it has other benefits. There's there's some good work from Copenhagen University that shows that physical acti if you have physical activity as part of a weight program, it helps preserve muscle mass. And that's very good. And we, we didn't get a chance to talk about lean tissue, but muscle mass is critical to preserve for weight loss. Um, for me, I think probably the simple guidance is if, if we're trying to do more is, is just do what you can and do more of what what works with, with a dog. You know, we, we can't get more running marathons. Um, I think the sort of hydrotherapy solutions are brilliant, but they're, they're, they're quite labor intensive for, for an owner. So it's really just if they, if they could, if they can walk and you can do a third more, that for me is a useful rule. Yeah, I tell you what, that will help. That will go into number four for me. <laughs> when, people, when people are buying stuff for their dog, mm. take a health connotation to it. So you you want to treat your dog, you want to buy them something. You, that's how you express love. Think about an activity monitor. I've been trialing the pit pat on Luna. And um, it's so easy to use. It's and it's a little bit geeky. You're going to go, what did I do today compared to yesterday? Hmm. If you're going to follow with, I'm going to slowly increase my dog's exercise. Don't do it dramatically because the tissues will not be up to it. Those ligaments, those tendons, everything's going too quickly. Hmm. But think about getting an activity monitor. Um, and they're available in the camp shop. So there you go. Um, number three. <laughs> <laughs> So number three, do I get, I get to choose something? I don't know. I've, I've only got two left. Oh my goodness. What am I going to say? Um, <laughs> I think, um, I think with any of these things, I, um, I, I, I guess it's talking about goals and success. I, I think maybe coming back to starting, just think small initially and ultimately um, you get big success. This comes back to, to weight management. It's little changes can make a big difference. So when we talk to our owners um, and we put them on, a, on, a, on any sort of weight plan, within two weeks, they seem to be noticing changes and improvements, not just mobility, but quality of life. Um, and there's a, sometimes people get daunted if, the, if there's a, a big goal, you know, if they've got a lot of weight to lose. Um, uh, but for me, actually you can get a lot of benefits even with the first bit i said the six to nine percent earlier um but some sometimes just small differences and I, and I guess it's keeping it off is is probably more key so i'd i'd be happier start small and keep it off rather than say oh, i'm gonna lose 20 kilos or you know my dog's gonna lose 20 kilos so i think it's probably small builds big yeah no and you did the you did that paper talking about vitality that how with weight loss changes and i love that word the animal's vitality mm. improves and we all want that i want luna to be for the vitality yeah um, that's right yes yeah. i was just going to say on on that um we should think again for weight loss you should think less about weight loss and more about health gain i think is is another thing yeah. because we worry that people get dissuaded from oh, going on a diet and things because it's that's negative but actually the benefits is the thing and it's that as you say the vitality is key it's so interesting because all of medical care and like physiotherapy and talking about frailty and stuff is mm -hmm. they're really now realizing that that form of communication doesn't achieve the goals but if they talk mm -hmm. about what people can do and what they're going to be able to do it actually hits their targets not talk about what they can't do brilliant stuff um, mm -hmm. number two for me is, is a fantastic fantastic community group that can run is called holly's army and um, a lot of this stuff guys you feel like you're doing it on your own you're not there is an amazing digital community and holly's army is full of nearly six thousand owners it's run by the wonderful ambassadors who are owners like you that have gone on and done extra cam training how dedicated they are they're volunteers they're doing extra training so that they can make sure that this forum stays safe it's not allowing any marketing. It keeps to evidence base, and there are people like you that are going to support you through the highs and lows. So, please, professionals, talk about Holly's Army because your owners are going to go somewhere online. So, send them somewhere safe. And owners, please join Holly's Army to have somebody watching your back and helping you on the ups and downs. So that's my number two. Number 
one, the biggie. <laughs> so um, we talked a lot about weighing, and I sort of said weigh your, your dog all the time. But my number one is weighing food, I would say. Weighing food, um, not using measuring cups. We, we kind of touched upon it before. We did a study where we we asked people to try to weigh out portions of food with a cup and trying to weigh the same amount is virtually impossible you could try it yourself yeah. if you weigh it out and put it on the uh, put it on the cup and then on the scales but here was the thing um it never balances so 80 percent of the time people tend to put too much food in um added to that the measuring cups themselves are often inaccurate so the lines don't add up to what you think they do so yeah. i guess if there's one th way of keeping in touch with things is actually weigh the food out um you could have your treat jar you can put all the food in the jar anyway and, and then you've got your daily portion you can help and match but i think for me that would be one of the big things not just for prevention of obesity but for management of obesity and for that matter arthritis because as i said right at the start um weight management is the most successful form it of is. arthritis and management it's free and it's kind of heartbreaking when people are spending a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money and all these different interventions that are going on their iPad late at night, buying anything that they feel can inter, you know, um, interrupt the pain of the OA and they're like, get the weight off. Massive <laughs> difference. Well, you've got lots of fans because everybody's like, oh, it's lovely. Will you come back? <laughs> yes, you can do. <laughs> And you're, well, you're writing the first course for obesity and, and weight <laughs> management for canine professionals. Look at that, all in one night. <laughs> could, I have to um, say, no, you know, if, yeah. It's been lovely it, having you. But if, there is one question here that somebody okay. would say, was saying, can you point me to the studies about the early cat neutering? We were pressured more and more by this new kittens early four months with larger by okay. charities. Um, okay, so, yes. So there's, there's a, I mean, <laughs> There are a lot of covering various health aspects of um, uh, of, of cat neutering. The the one actually on uh, the sort of risks in terms of that. There's there's some there are some experimental studies. When I say that, there's studies in colony cats looking at body fat changes, which I could share. Watch this space because we've got some work under review at the moment. Uh, so probably the best thing is uh, if if they're happy to be patient. I can update people when it's out in the public, in the sort of public domain, as it were. No, 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 uh, definitely let me know and I will share that. That would be 100%. Yeah. We, have, we have a couple of lovely academics that throw me things that need to be publicised. So when, um, when the pain and behaviour paper came out by Professor Danny Mills and his mm. team, it's like, yeah. put it out, quick, put it out there. So yes, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, and okay. Just, any more comments? No, all nothing but love, which is fantastic. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I'm really, really grateful. It thank is you. a real pleasure to have you. And thank you, Cam, for us for listening. Spread the word. And we will see you next week. See you later. Great. Thanks again. <laughs>